Safe rooms are the topic of this week's Gaming the Podcast, those things with the typewriters in them in Resident Evil games. Specifically, we're talking about how and why they work and how they are designed to inform and enhance those things both inside of their walls and those things that take place outside of them. I am John Robertson and I am joined as ever by Stace Harmon. Now, one thing to note in this episode is that we did suffer a slight microphone issue on Stace's end, which we weren't able to fix in time for release, such are the dangers of recording remotely in a lockdown. Rest assured though that this issue has now been fixed and it will not affect future episodes, just as it hasn't affected previous ones. Whatever the case though, apologies for the reduced quality of this release. Otherwise, do drop us a follow on Twitter to chat with us about safe rooms and all other game related topics. We are at Indie by Design, that's at Indie by Design. And do check out our website, indiebydesign.net, where you'll find all the info on all of the video game books we've written and released. Okay, make sure you've got some spare ink ribbons because we're now going into the safe room. I've been playing through uh, the Resident Evil remake recently for a future podcast episode, actually, that's coming up later on in March. And in doing that, uh, something that has struck me, I think, has resonated the most with me about the original Resident Evil um, and its and its remake, is how brilliantly designed and implemented the safe rooms are. Now, everybody knows about the Resident Evil safe rooms. It's that place in the game where you you enter and the music plays and it's very soothing and you know that you are effectively safe and invincible and that you're not going to be um you can't be attacked you're not you can put the controller down and go and do whatever else you need to do if you want to um but i think the thing that's the two things that have struck me most about it in replaying resident evil is the the peaks and troughs notion like that's you know the tension and release so there's a lot of tension in the build up to getting to a safe room and if you know where they are then you can you can make a beeline for them but if you don't there's also that like just coming across it um coming in from the coming in from the cold from the outside hostile world and finding a place to be to be safe and that's the moment where you can then take a breath and all of that stuff that you've just been through kind of can catch up with you you can have that that you've had all that tension and you get to have that release and you get to process what's been going on but i think the thing that's most interesting about it for me is the how explicit they are and it's not just in how explicit it is that you are at that point safe it's what the counter to that means that if you're if you are explicitly safe in this place then you are explicitly not safe everywhere else so everywhere else that you go there's tension everywhere else you go there can be jump scares you can be got at by the various things in resident evil and i think that that explicitness is what's really stood out for me in playing it through again and and but it's the counter the counter to it not just yet as i say the explicitness of being safe but what that means when i step out of out of that door and i mean you've been playing a lot of resident evil all of the resident evils uh again recently and is that i mean is that a thing that you see evolve over the different games is it a thing that you you know are you explicitly aware of it as you're as you're playing through the different resident evil games that you you get to that safe space and that's there's a definite different feeling about those locations um yeah for sure i mean yeah so yeah so i'm playing through all of the resident evils again um leading up to resident evil 8 coming out so all, all of the mainline resident evil uh games so i've been through one to make sure you've got the story the narrative thread you want to yeah, make sure right. you've got that all lined up. uh so i've been to I've, <laughs> the important yeah so i've been through resident evil 123 remake again recently i played resident evil 7 finished that a couple of weeks ago so i've just got four five and six to go um and yeah i mean yeah they they definitely do change over time i mean one two and three use them in very similar ways uh here are various rooms and they've got storage boxes and um typewriters and whatever in them um resident evil 7 is a bit different because there's like that central um trailer for much of the game that acts as the the safe room like the place where you go and then and then that's kind of in the centralized position and then the three areas of that sort of mansion uh, farmhouse area are, are all leading off from that so it has changed um but yeah like you say like their most interesting thing about them i guess or their main reason for existence not like yes they this they obviously provide you a place to save yes they provide you a place to store equipment that can be accessed through any of them 
Um, but as you say, the core of them is about tension and release. The you know survival horror games. Um, talking about Resident Evil here, so you know survival horror genre um, relies on that tension and release. Like it's that it's just that um, you know it's it's horror films, horror books, horror anything. If you're constantly uh, brought face to face with the horror and the tension is really high and the excitement and the scares are really high all the time, then you very quickly become desensitized to it. And the only way then to make it more scary, more tense is to ramp up the tension, ramp up the uh, every second. Of that, But then that's exhausting. Like who wants to play something like that for, especially with games as well, which are longer than films. Maybe you can get away with it in like a shorter film like Texas Chainsaw Massacre doesn't really have much it still does, still has to have tension release, but it's but it tends to be just a rapidly rising tension all the time. But the film's only like 70 minutes long, so it's fine. Um, whereas in, in like, you know, what's the first Resident Evil? Like 12 hours, 12, yeah. 12 13 hours yeah. for most people? Um, you can't have that, can you? You can't just have now tense and then more tense and more tense and more tense and more tense until the end where suddenly it's all released. Like, it's exhausting. Yeah. I would argue, I think, I mean, yeah, absolutely, you do become desensitized. And for me personally, who isn't a great, horror film or horror game lover uh, or even watcher um i i am a scaredy cat uh they are it's necessary because it is the thing that allows me to then keep being uh, i mean maybe not scared but at least on edge you know nervous uh like that just uncomfortable feeling yeah, is created by the existence of those safe rooms. You know, I always thought those safe rooms were my friend, and it turns out that actually they uh, they're there just so that I can then feel scared in the rest. Yeah, of the game. they, so, they facilitate yes. your horror by allowing the horror to reduce and then throw it back at you. Whereas if you're just constantly mm. feeling horror all the time, then pretty soon you're not going to feel horror, are you? Like if if you're, um, it's just like getting used to the cold or getting used to the warm or getting used to mm. the the loud noises or whatever it is like you do adjust to it pretty quickly like uh you because it's just that exposure therapy basically isn't it like you learn yeah. you learn that spiders aren't going to kill you and aren't well some most of them are not going to kill you. um through exposing <laughs> yourself might, yeah through exposing yourself to spiders uh so the more the more you mm. walk face to face with them the less scared you should, in theory so you shouldn't have a bad experience um you should be and it, and it's just the same it's just the same as in in the horror games but um well games with safe rooms it doesn't just have to be horror because it could be a- action as well um sometimes you need a break from the action in order to make the action yeah. feel like action you can't just be like you know again to use films like typical action film die hard it's not just action actually it's not just shoot out after shoot after shoot after shoot after shoot out um and some films are like that but they tend to be a bit not, not even exhausting just a bit boring like mm. um and well yeah because you you re i think you recontextualize it don't you you're you even subconsciously you get used to the idea after a certain amount of time of what something is, and that might be horror or, or gore or action. And so then your, I think anyway, your mind then seeks out lulls in that action or gore or horror that where it's just a slight lessening of it because you're you're looking for so, like it's like a new normal. It's like well, if it's just going to be like this all the time, then I need to understand where I can take a breath and take a break. And so you find that and you do that by becoming desensitized. And and Resident Evil 7, I think, there's a really good example of that for me. That right at the beginning, I found that incredibly, oh, particularly in VR, but even not in VR, just normal. Right at the beginning, when you go into the house for the first time and you don't have a weapon and you're just poking around in this dirty kitchen, uh, I found that incredibly tense. Like and that and and then but the break in tension there didn't come from finding a safe room it came from what to me was this sort of ludicrous moment where this chainsaw wielding is it a chainsaw well i think it's a chainsaw isn't it yes yeah, she, so, anyway, she she comes she jumps out at chainsaw. you and hacks your arm off um spoiler or your hand your off. Wrist, yeah you're yeah and it's like and i kind of laughed at that point and that is that release from tension but it wasn't to, for me that particular instance wasn't in a good way it didn't yeah yeah it released the tension by the, just this ludicrous climatic thing happening. Yeah. Um, it still served the same purpose, but yeah, that's, I prefer it when, when it's a quiet release, when it's a, like a, a, you know, a sigh of relief effectively, like that music kicks in in the safe room and you know that you're okay and you know, you can stay there for as long as you want. And that allows me, my mind to then start processing all the stuff that 
has happened and oh that was really close so you know i nearly got caught by x zombie or that hunter or whatever it might yeah. be but it also then allows that reintegration back into that world and that ramping up at your own pace of right i'm going to check all my equipment i'm going to manage my infantry i'm going to maybe read any of the files that i haven't read um that i've collected throughout the world that i haven't read previously and then i'm going to go back out there and it's the one i suppose it's you know it's that it represents a moment of control doesn't it in a in a moment where you can i can then kind of imprint myself on the game and say i'm going to do it in this way yeah and then i'm going to go back outside and get subjected to all of this Crazy yeah mistake. yeah i mean yeah so just go back to the thing in the kitchen with resident evil so um it kind of when you're saying that it kind of reminds me of so there's a famous um hitchcock thing where he talks about um like the use of a gun in a movie and so uh just someone coming out and shooting someone without any kind of build-up or any knowledge from the audience mm. that there's a gun involved or someone that's crazy or whatever and then just someone coming out shooting someone then that's shocking and it's like exciting and it takes you by surprise but it's not scary it's not tense but if you yeah. but if there are two people sitting down having a conversation and you as the audience knows that there's a gun underneath the table and you know that only mm-hmm. one one of the two knows that there's a gun under the table then immediately there's tension immediately there's drama immediately there's all of this stuff and they kind of do that in resident evil 7 the kitchen scene not by saying here's a person we we're going to show you the audience that there's someone with a chainsaw here and but the character ethan doesn't know that so you feel scared for him um it does it through you know aesthetics it does it through the the noises it does it through the lack of um light it does it through the horrible things that you're seeing just Mm. to sort of all this sort of weird stuff um and if it didn't do that if it was a normal house a normal kitchen and then suddenly someone flies out a chainsaw it's like well it's not scary is it it's just going to be surprising um Mm. and uh, it's a a jump scare at best um but jump scares not scary they're just surprising um there's a difference um, and considered quite a cheap way of scaring your audience, right? That that and that's well, what you see yeah, on the horror no film up. trailers, there's isn't no it? It's like they use that that those audience reaction moments where it's everybody jumps as a as, as yeah, it's like an indication that oh look how scary this is, and it's well, that's not though. Like you know, something that builds over time and is more insidious than that, and is more like yeah, uncomfortable than that. It's far, far yeah, more scary. To and me. safe, yeah, safe rooms help to sort of build that that kind of tension there's a really interesting example and i don't know if it's on purpose or not but in the resident evil 2 remake um claire b uh claire second story whatever it was called claire b in the original i think it might be called claire second story or something in the remake um but there's a moment at the very start on that where you go and you see leon at at the other side of the gate and you don't have a key to get through uh, or you don't have yeah it's a key that you need is it a key yeah it's a key you need to get through and um you do the cutscene and then you don't have a gun. Oh, no, you do have a gun. Um, but you do the cutscene, you run back to the zombies and through the zombies, avoiding them, probably, so you don't have much ammo. And then you go into this little room that doesn't have a save point in it, I don't think, but it is a safe room. It has a chest in there and it's got the key that you need to go back and open the, um, the gate. Um, but as you're running through the zombies and you go into the safe room... Uh, in mine what happened was a zombie followed me and just was waiting outside of the safe room so even though i was safe in the safe room the zombie still knew that still knew that i was in there and it was just hovering outside the door um waiting for me to come out so i was just sat in there just thinking oh how am i going to deal with this i don't really want to use my ammo so early in the game i don't have health items or whatever i don't want to use them at least um so the safe room in that instance, or the semi-safe room, doesn't have a typewriter in it, but has everything else. The semi kind of safe room, or at least the first the first present, the first touch of a safe room that you have in that game, is used as a game design device almost with this zombie that's outside the door to tell you that even the bits that you thought were the safest are now going to be less safe in this in this playroom. That they're making it massively obvious that you're not going to be given as many chances here because here you go, here's your first sanctuary and immediately on the outside of that sanctuary you can see the danger right there in your face. And that doesn't really happen so much when you're playing on your first playthroughs. You might get unlucky and that happens, but typically in Resident Evil 2 Remake safe rooms, you, you walk out the door and you're fine. Like you've got you've got time yeah. to... There's more, yeah, there's like a zone around, yeah, even if it's just that the zombies are a little bit away, you've got time to raise your gun and yeah. decide... 
assess how to best deal with them. So that that in that instance, that sounds like that sounds like using the safe room as a instead of being safe from the dangers of the outside world, you're kind of trapped by the dangers of the outside world in this room yeah. that you you have makes come it, to recognise as being safe. Yeah, it makes it That's, more claustrophobic yeah. as a like yes, you're safe, but you're giving up your uh freedom in a way to have safety mm. like i guess that's like a philosophical point that you could make are you only safe when your freedom is taken away um mm. but that's kind of that's kind of the point uh i see of that that bit of the game is that it's telling you like yes you're safe so long as you confine yourself and remove your freedoms by being in here as soon as you give yourself freedom again mm. to go back in the world you're in danger now so do you want to just be the sheltered sort of shut in and have total safety or do you want to go out and brave the dangers of the world around you and that's quite an interesting use yeah. of it in in that game i don't know if it's on purpose i don't know if it's just something that got that happened to me because i don't know if it's like a planned event or if it's just a piece of mm. just the ai reacting in that way then i have to go back and play it again i suppose it does speak to yeah like so mr x in resident evil 2 and uh nemesis in three um you know there's lots of examples of there's lots of videos lots of examples of the goofiness of the safe rooms and about how they can't get you 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 know you can stand there and open the door and they can't get you there's some glitches where they can grab hold of you or you you know you shoot them in a certain way and they fall down into the safe room or whatever but typically it's not designed that they can get you even to the point like even you know the designers know that clearly they know that it can be exploited. You can show how seemingly silly it is that they can't get in there by opening the door. But it's such, for me, that just reinforces, again, it like reinforces the language of the game because you understand that and you know that. You know, no matter how much you try and break that rule of the game, you can't. It's been designed that you can't do that, which just means that it can be used to enforce those other feelings because you know that even when you try you can't break it so if you know that then again this notion of like explicitly safe explicitly unsafe is made stronger but even though they're kind of giving up the verisimilitude of this world by saying isn't it dumb that you like they can't get you through these doors is that that's it's still being used in a uh, productive in a like in a positive way for the overall feel of the game because it's yeah, there's then and it good and I think like we've talked about this, we were talking about this earlier, and you were talking about how safe rooms and p- perhaps that's an example of that, but how safe rooms are kind of they go against what is typically considered to be yeah. good game design. Yeah. Right? Well yeah. Because the, because the, is that is that because they're so explicit? Uh well yeah, like basically everything you've just said. Like so yes, they break the rules. Not only do they break the rules of the game. Uh, well, they don't break the rules of the game because they're, they're part of the rule system of the game, but they break the rules of the majority of the game space and that here's an exception to the rules in, like, the zombies can't come through the windows, they can't open a door, they can't hurt you, or, well, they're not, they're not supposed to be able to anyway, of course, they can sometimes. But, um, yeah, I guess from if, like, you know, there's this kind of approach to most games that are trying to be quote-unquote cinematic which resident evil would fall into i would say uh most survival horror games would fall into um <clears throat> and the level design, design the game design approach of wanting to entice feelings from the player wanting to entice emotions and responses from the player through the lake through the game and the level design but doing so in a way that's not just in your face and and mm. intrusive so not just you know literally telling players you are supposed to feel angry here you are supposed to feel excited now you are supposed to feel safe now but safe rooms do do that they are intrusive in their design they are incredibly in your face they they slap you around the face and say the real game the quote-unquote real game is now paused Mm -hmm. and you can just do whatever you want like well not whatever you can do you can spend as much time in here and you're safe to do whatever the Mm. activities are that are possible within this space um so they're incredibly mechanical like which is interesting because they're still they work really well but they break the rules of modern game design in that trying to be trying to hide the mechanics of the game really trying to trying Mm. to make everything Mm. have this layer of cinema have this layer of narrative have this layer of kind of the whole world um feeling realistic uh in and of itself um 
But obviously, safe rooms are not that, are they? Um, yeah. And yeah, we talked a few episodes ago, didn't we, about like death in games and about how designers go to great lengths to try and explain, to try and give some some in-game uh, logic and sense to the notion that you can die. Yeah, yeah. And about how that's just, so they try and hide this very mechanical element of of lots of video games in that way. Yeah. And this is this is the kind of counter to that. Yeah. It's like very much saying we want you to know. We're like we're, yeah, in Resident Evil, Evil Evil's case. We're going to make other things look so dumb that they can't get in here, and you, no matter how much you try, that you know that you're safe. Yeah, yeah, and that, yeah. That is incredible. It, it, it sets you up as a superhero essentially because you've got this space in the game in which, no matter the terrors of the outside world, no matter how powerful they are, no matter how powerful the nemesis or Mister X is, they are incapable of hurting you when oh. you're in this place. So you do have like a superhero system essentially in which you can put on a shield of invincibility. Yes, you might oh. not be able to make any progress if you wear the shield, but you do have an ability to go into your shell and just turtle up and be completely immune. Um, and I would argue is that they, even though they're seen and perceived as these quiet calm spaces in which the lighting is soft and the music is soft and you know you can relax and sort out your items and what you want to take out mm. from your inventory and whatever i would argue that in the design sense they're incredibly loud like they're incredibly boom mm -hmm. we are different like this is this sets aside from the game when you're in here everything changes the rules are different like I, this incredibly loud piece of design rather than being subtle and calm like aesthetically it's calm mm. yes but like design wise it's like incredibly jagged and like in your face um but i don't mean that as a negative i think actually it's interesting in that they're not very cinematic at all they're like the opposite of cinematic like in a film rarely do rarely do you do the characters just lock themselves in somewhere and say we can just spend as much time as <laughs> we can spend the next five hours here now and we're going to be safe like that's not true is it because if the if the bad guy in a slasher movie can't get you and ever uh, at a certain point then it's like well why why do i care about these characters they're not in danger anymore they've just worked oh, out a way to save oh. themselves so whatever so it doesn't really happen in films um but i would say that the fact that safe rooms work to increase the horror and increase the tension and increase the the quality of or the, the reward for the release of the tension proves that games don't just have to rely on this obsession of making everything like quote unquote cinematic in the way that films are they've got oh. the you know resident evil and other survival horror games have developed this very uncinematic very gamey incredibly mechanics heavy way of presenting horror uh, buffing horror through this room um in a way that films can't and yet it's still the mm. game's still really scary and the game's made scarier through the safe room so yeah i think it's an interesting example of whilst everyone's aiming for this cinema feel actually one of the things that makes it most scary is the thing that's anti-cinematic mm. yeah yeah and that and there is uh, a similar i think in listening to you talk about that there's a similar feeling in death stranding and that isn't so much from a horror perspective but that's from a like the onerous um tasks and i don't mean you know some people would argue that playing death stranding is, is itself an onerous task but i'm not one of those people um so yeah the onerous ta nature of what sam bridges is doing in death stranding the trudging around the fact that in that game there are enemies in the traditional sense in the bts and also the human bandits but there's also just the very fact that if you're up a mountain in the freezing cold then you need stuff to survive the elements otherwise the very you know the weather itself is going to kill you and later in the game you get the ability to create your own safe rooms you get the you need a, a blueprint a bunch of resources and all the rest of it but you can create your own safe room wherever you want which I think add, for me that adds a an extra level to that because you get to decide where you put that. You get to decide, you know, that you kind of carve out this space for yourself in the world that is very personal to you because you've decided to put it where you've decided to put it. And once you go into that safe room, it's, you know, it's the same thing. It's, it's safe. You're not going to get attacked in there. There's some like some jump scare stuff just with you know where he's dreaming and you don't know that's happening and then he gets there's a, a jump scare with like the baby or something like mm. that but by and large you're not in any actual danger you can't die um but they also serve as like 
this notion of embracing even more, even more mechanically, even further beyond the Resident Evil style, they embrace this notion of it being a space outside the game by doing things like you can put music on. There's like a music player. Mm. You can access the in-game music player uh, to listen to any of the tracks that you've heard out in the world. You can then go th- read your emails. Like it's it's like, you know, it's like effectively a little mini office mm. or like home space for yourself where you put music on, you read your emails, you you can pull silly faces in the mirror if you're so inclined. Mm. Um, and so that is even more, for me, that is even more like, relax that's not just giving you the room as in a literal room like resident evil does to relax it's giving you the tools by which to do so as well it's saying put some music on and get yourself a drink and you know look at this these silly collectibles that you can get and and that and again you get to then choose when you go back into the world and when you re-engage but that is a that's a like, uh, what, is there another room, another word for that? Because it's a safe room, and it, I think it is literally called a safe room in the game. Yeah. But it's not, it's almost like a respite room. Like, you're not really necessarily needing to be safe from anything. You're just taking a break. You're, you're diffusing that tension yourself and taking a break from, I don't know, just like the, just, well, well from the reality the game, of the, kind of. the gameplay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. But you're still playing the game. You're still you're still in it, and that's and that's yeah, that's quite. Yeah, there are. I think different. there are some other things that are similar to that. So I think in Don't Starve, the campsites that you define yourself, mm-hmm. apart from your first one, um, you you put your own ones up, and then that's about how far do you want to risk going from your other campsite mm-hmm. before you put this one down? I mean, that that they do actually save you from things in the world because at night things will come and kill you and hurt you and you don't have any light. Um, so mm. you so you do need to make the campsites and you need to put them and you choose how far you want to venture out between each each one. Um, yeah, I don't know what the, I don't know what the official name is. I don't know if there is an official name for that, like piece of design, that sort of do-it-yourself camp. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's slightly different. So I think there are. So I made a list of things that they that, that safe rooms represent, and it's probably it still also encompasses that those examples. So um, they're a calm place to take stock within the game, which is that tension and release that we've talked about, but mm-hmm. also to like plan how you're going to do that run. So like, what guns am I going to take? Uh, and sometimes you might have four knowledge of that because you might have like gone and died mm. and then you reload. So it's like, okay, I didn't have the grenade launcher. I didn't have enough healing, like whatever. Um, but they also represents beacon of, can represent beacons of progress. This depends on what the, how the layout of the game is. So I think something like Death Stranding mm. or Don't Starve, they do genuinely represent beacons of progress because you've decided to stamp your progress here for some reason. I think in Resident Evil, yeah. um, <clears throat> once you've unlocked the safe rooms, they don't represent beacons of progress anymore because it's a, you know, it's a backtracky game. Backtracky is a negative word, but I don't mean it like that. You know, it's a game that's set within a single environment that you explore multiple times. Yeah. Um, so they don't really always necessarily represent progress in the same way, but they kind of do represent progress because it could be like, oh, now I have, so now I will store this emblem in in here, or now I so so you are still progressing by. And you would still them. probably talk about them as like getting to the next safe room, even if even if it's a safe room you've previously been to, like that you would measure forward progress by getting towards something getting to the next save yeah. safe room then allows you to even if for that instance is just to save your progress so you don't lose you don't lose it it's yeah. so yeah yeah there is like a forward momentum to it and yeah in like the bonfires in dark souls as well so it's that kind of thing yeah. like you get to the next point yeah. that is safe um and then they yeah. can also represent like upgrades and progress hubs so like narrative progress hubs like mm-hmm. mechanical progress hubs like so if there's like workbenches or whatever then you can you know they they they'll often be in a safe area if not a safe room um or they could be an entirely different hub like in demon souls or you know mmos or things like that they are completely separate from the environment yeah. of the game whereas the resident evil room is within the mansion or within the police station the hub in demon souls the nexus is a completely other place like that you magically yeah. transport and the yourself nexus, to. i find the nexus quite intriguing because uh because that is a safe room effectively or a safe space a hub however you want to term it but that is a safe room that 
you use in a different way. Like for a lot of the NPCs that are in the Nexus, that is a safe room. And yet potentially you can be the scourge of that because you can go around killing them. That's their safe room that you are then you are then invading if you want to. You can treat it in that way. You also, and I know you'll be able to speak more to this having played the remake recently of Demon's Souls, but you also, I've heard it that there's a strategy that the Nexus is a place to kill yourself yeah, yeah, I after you've beaten a boss. Yeah, I did that. In order, if you want to mess around with like the world tendency, pushing it towards why. The, so it's a space, but, and that's quite a, I mean, I say it's not really a subvert. It's almost a, it's not a subversion. It's almost like a perversion of the notion of a safe room. It's a place where you can kill yourself for game mechanic yeah. reasons. Um, and a place where you can affect the narrative or the things available to you in the game by killing other people. And that's... Yeah. And so the Nexus is a... Uh, yeah, I find that to be like a really interesting space within yeah. the Souls universe because they moved away from it after that, didn't they? Like the Dark Souls games, after Demon Souls, the Dark Souls games became this uh, more... Well, I remember thinking of it at the time as it being like a more coherent world, but I don't... I think looking back it's on that... It's more of a linear true. progression... Uh, yeah. environment yeah. in dark souls you still do have the the kind of hubs like some of the, sh- the shrines are still hubs and still have like you can level up in them and mm. stuff um but yeah in demon souls yeah in demon souls the safe rooms re- no, the nexus represents um well the ability specifically the ability to kill yourself within the safe room it's almost like within the nexus it's it's almost like three freedom through death basically like so uh-huh. you kill yourself to have freedom from you kill yourself in the nexus specifically so your world tendency doesn't go down by killing yourself in one of yeah. the world areas it's kind of but, outside of the game world yeah but also you kill yourself so that you have freedom from people invading you in those worlds as well because when you're in mm. soul form mm. you can't be yeah. invaded but if you're in human form you can yeah so be using the safe room as a the nexus as a safe space to to give yourself the freedom of dying basically yeah Uh, because you don't want to die so you can affect the outside world and therefore the rest of the game through things that you do in the nexus in a way that you can't in resident evil for those reasons that we've talked about because very specifically you've got sure you've got freedom uh rather you've got safety in resident evil in those safe rooms but you don't have any freedom you can't do anything you can mess around with your inventory and decide how you're going to tackle the next challenge but you can't do anything to impact or affect the outside world um, slash you know the actual game whereas in demon souls you can very much do stuff that affects the outside world and only in that space is it safe to do that because if you do that in any of those in the, any of the actual levels or the world then you yeah you affect the yeah so that's the world yeah it's an interesting form of safe room because it's it uses death death in demon demon souls and whatever which we explored in the death in games episode a couple of months ago but um is is we'll see one of the core mechanics of that game and it uses the safe room as a way for you to be able to indulge in that mechanic in a way that is only positive, mm. only positive. So it's a safe room in the sense of all as as with all the other games that we've mentioned. It's safe as in safe from enemies. You can level up, you can change your gear, you can do whatever you want freely and safely, and take as much time over you want as as you want doing it. But you can also engage in the safest way possible with one mm. of the game's core mechanical conceits as well um Mm. which is an interesting uh an interesting use of a safe room to to give such a key game mechanic a different meaning uh a safe meaning in this in the single place does give the nexus if you're using it like that a lot of people don't play the game like that but if you're using it for that reason it does give the nexus this extra special place it's not just a sanctuary Mm. it's it's somewhere where you can very very sharply um influence what else you're going to experience it's it's very deliberate isn't it because they that's not a that's not an exploit that's not a glitch that's by the same token from software could have very easily had it that if you kill yourself in the nexus then it affects all of the worlds that are connected to that nexus Mm. negatively they all move towards black world tendency but they didn't they chose to have it that it doesn't affect any of them and that is a very deliberate design choice and so it's yeah that's it's been woven into the 
game, even if you don't, you know, it might they don't explain that to you. There's no like, oh, and if you kill yourself in the Nexus, etc. There's, yeah. there's none of that. They, you have to find that out, like a lot of things in Demon Souls, through experimentation yeah. and the online community. They could have gated stuff within the Nexus as well. So your world tendency will determine what you can and can't do in a world. So like that gate will be closed or that enemy won't appear or whatever. Mm. They could have done that in a Nexus as well. Like if you keep killing yourself in a Nexus, mm. then it's mm. like, right, now we're gating off the weaponsmith guy and now we're gating off yeah. this area of the Nexus yeah. so you can't do that anymore or whatever, but they didn't do and so that. It's, and so it's deliberate. And like that, I think that's always an interesting point to consider that lots, not lots of things, but that notion, we've touched on it before, we should do an episode on it at some point, that notion of playing the game in a way that the developers didn't intend is something that I find really interesting because it's like if the if there are rules, that means those rules can be subverted and that is deliberate. It might not be the way that most people do it. It might not be the typical way, you know, but it's it's you're using the rules, the tools that you have to in order to, to achieve something. So, yeah, that's something we can uh, perhaps explore in another episode yeah. because this is safe rooms yeah well i mean and we've basically run out of time now as well but the nexus is a good example of just one more thing that i want to mention so um in uh you know sort of human like psychology the like circles uh circular things like the nexus the nexus is architecturally circular um circular things in the mind represent uh you know safety and warmth and cuddly you know Mm -hmm. inviting stuff whereas it's it's opposite spiky jaggedy things represent like danger and you know fear and suspicion and and that sort of stuff and you Mm. see this all the time like it's like disney characters are always designed like this like aladdin Mm -hmm. is really smooth and rounded whereas jafar his enemy is really spiky and really angular and really thin uh like mufasa in lion king is really rounded and soft featured whereas scar his nemesis his murderer is angular and horrible and like his teeth are always (laughs) showing and his eyes are like uh you know like more severe um yeah or like he has a very and a very jagged spiky scar yeah literally yeah that's, or that's like really maleficent good. like you know sleeping beauties so uh the enemy and sleeping beauty She's really like you know frick, like crazy just like mm. insane jaggedy to angular point of her cheekbones being quite yeah. angular yeah as well, or like even. wizard of oz like wicked witch like the, the big nose and the and this and the spiky mm-hmm. hat and um you know mario even like you know just mario is basically just all circles so all circles and like curved lines whereas like wario and bowser are also circular but they got spikes they got a spiky mustache they got spikes literally spikes on their shell whatever on their wrists um so depictions of even something like the devil is all spiky spiky horns spiky tail whereas angels have halos which are yeah, round. round and like nice curved wings <laughs> and stuff um yeah. but safe rooms do that as well they they employ these circular tricks and it's easy to notice it when you when you're kind of aware of it it's something that just sort of subconsciously washes over us i think but when you when you're aware of it you notice it in it's used in architecture all the time and like buildings that mm. like want to, you to feel calm will have like a circular a circular garden in the middle or like circular rounded furniture rather than like angular but you know angular mm. stuff's often used in like to to define like the the evil corporation or like you know yeah. sauron and saruman in lord of the rings literally live in giant spikes uh like yeah. um, this is the hobbits that live in circular circular windowed circular yeah. board um so nice. safe rooms do the same thing as well so then obviously they're not actual circles although interestingly the first safe room in amnesia rebirth is just a literal circle or like an oval at least mm-hmm. um whereas and the nexus and demon souls is a literal circle but often it's just like objects and stuff like like the desk in the police station in resident evil 2 is a circle and, and a, a rounded desk there's loads of rounded pillars mm-hmm. uh rounded lamps uh you know lights in resident evil one safe rooms like resident evil one safe rooms are square but the lights are very rounded they give off very soft rounded shadows whereas in the rest of the game the shadows are very straight and very pointed mm-hmm. um so you know their their designs they they have very specific aesthetic considerations as to make us feel yeah. safe in them, rather than just the mechanical. Okay, I don't. I now know nothing can get in the door. I now know I can use a typewriter. Aesthetically, and then also obviously there's a calming music and stuff as well. But um, yeah, visually they are 
they all have these circular elements, whether it's the actual room as a circle or just circular lamps or circular tables or circular shadows or whatever. But that's really powerful. And that's, um, yeah, it's an architectural thing. Architecture is often built like that. You imagine like, you know, a friend, the friendly car castle is rounded and kind of probably a bit stumpy and a bit fat. Whereas the, uh-huh. in like a Disney movie, whereas the, the enemy castle will be like Gothic and spiky and like yeah. chains and yeah. sp- like, you know, sp- everything all over the place, like triangular, like little windows rather than circles. Um, mm. And so, yeah. And so clearly like safe rooms are, are, are used for more than just saving your game. There's a whole, psychological physiological subconscious uh subconscious reading of these things going on which which i guess to take it all the way back or loop it all the way back round in a nice pleasing safety circle uh the play replaying that resident evil that first resident evil game and and thinking about safe rooms in this way i think it helps to it serves to highlight how intrinsic a part the safe room is to how iconic Resident Evil has become as a series. And that's, mm. yeah, because it's used as a, it to do all of these things in its design rather than just as a way to save your game. Safe rooms then are more than a safe room. That seems to be the overarching message. Come and tell us about your safe room experiences on Twitter. We are at Indie by Design. Via our Twitter, you'll also find a link to our Discord, which we've just recently set up. So come and get involved in the conversation there. And once again, a reminder that you can check out our video game books by visiting our website, indiebydesign.net. That's indiebydesign.net. Pre-orders are currently open for 20 Double Fine Years, our book of all things Tim Schafer and Double Fine Productions, and there are some tasty pre-order bonuses to take advantage of. Apologies again for the audio quality of this week's episode, and rest assured that we'll be back to normal again with the next release. See you then, and enjoy your week.